Hello and welcome to my December month end wrap up. I read volume one of the two volume biography of Samuel Taylor Coleridge by Richard Holmes, the first volume of which is called Early Visions. I commented on this volume in my December mid month wrap up, which you can see in the info cards above. In the last half of December, I finished reading volume two which is called Darker Reflections. There are two types of biographers, the warm biographers and the cool biographers. The warm biographer reads all the material about his or her, her subject and then digests it and assimilates it. Then he reimagines his subject and reproduces the life of his subject in a powerful narrative driven style that brings the subject to life on the page that causes the subject to live in the mind of the reader. These are popular biographies for the general reader. The core cool biographer which Richard Holmes exemplifies reads all the material on his subject and retells a factual account of the day-to-day -day details of the subject's life. The material is largely undigested and is given to the reader almost entire. Copious reference notes are appended to practically every statement to confirm the biographer's research. In the case of Darker Reflections, the reference notes for Chapter 1 number 193. In total, the whole work comprises 21 pages of such reference notes. Now, these reference notes do not elucidate the text by way of additional thoughts, as they mostly consist of the word Ibid, which is Latin for in the same place. These reference notes are for the purpose of indicating to other academics the source from which the information is derived. In the entire history of reading, has any average reader ever consulted the source of these reference notes? I think not. There is just over a page of bibliography and three pages of source, sources quoted. This is an academic work for other academics. So if all you want is an academic factual account of the events in Coleridge's life, then this biography will deliver it admirably. The breadth of research, as already indicated, is exemplary and outstanding. No detail is left unexplained. No source is left unexamined. No event is left unexplained. So that at the end of this biography, you will know everything that you would ever wish to know about Coleridge. In one sense, through the massive detail that Holmes provides, Coleridge does begin to emerge as a fully rounded, if flawed, human being. At the end of Volume 1, we left Coleridge on his way to Malta. He had settled the annuity of £150 from the Wedgwoods on his wife Sarah, had taken out a large insurance policy on his life in favour of his wife, and was seeking a new life for himself in Malta as a diplomat. Holmes writes, what was he really doing in the Mediterranean? Did he intend to make a new life out there? To abandon once and for all the difficulties of his marriage? The affections of his children? The ambiguous dreams of happiness with Ezra and the Wordsworths? Could he remake his career as a civil servant and a diplomat, writing poetry and political reports? Coleridge did make a success as a civil servant and was highly regarded by the g g governor of Malta for whom he worked. But after 18 months, Coleridge returned to England, but did not visit his wife and children again until another 18 months elapsed. In 1808, Coleridge was invited by the Royal Institute to give a course of lectures, which he gave to great acclaim. This established Coleridge as a public lecturer, which continued for 10 years. In 1809, he published a weekly newspaper called The Friend, which he wrote, edited and published single-handedly. 
He began with a subscription base of 600, but this quickly anticipated due to the demands he made upon the readers. He knew that The Friend was described everywhere as an unreadable work, dry, obscure, fantastical, paradoxical, and God knows what else, according to each man's taste, as if they wished to revenge themselves on me for the loss of their shillings. After six months and 24 issues, the paper folded. It had not been a financial success. He later published the articles in The Friend as a book. The loss of his amanuensis and obsessive fantasy figure Azra caused Coleridge to sink even further into hopeless opium addiction. All his attempts at seeking a cure for his drug and drink addictions had all proved ineffectual. In the winter of 1810-1811, he presented a course of lectures on Shakespeare and Milton in illustration of the principles of poetry. In 1811, Coleridge returned to journalism and was taken on by the influential newspaper The Courier in Fleet Street. As a political journalist, Coleridge's reputation suffered due to his political opinions being at variance with his contemporaries. His friends thought that he had prostituted his genius by espousing patriotism and the government line. They felt that he had betrayed the radical cause. The backdrop to these political feelings was the Napoleonic Wars. In 1812, the year Napoleon invaded Russia, Coleridge had been booked for another course of lectures. He was in desperate need of money, as he was throughout most of his life. But the day before the lectures were to begin, Spencer Percival, the Prime Minister, was shot dead in the lobby of the House of Commons. The lectures were postponed for a week and when they were begun, the expected attendance of 500 had dwindled to 50. In 1813, Coleridge revised a play he had written. He had originally offered it to Richard Brinsley Sheridan in 1797, who was then the owner of the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane. Sheridan became bankrupt and the ownership passed into other hands. Now, in a revised version, the Drury Lane Committee accepted the play and it was a great success, earning between eight and ten thousand pounds for the theatre and several hundred pounds for courage. Later in 1813, Courage had to be treated for his addiction and suicidal depression. By 1814, the fashionable world believed that Courage had completely collapsed under the weight of his opium addiction and that a once br brilliant career was now ended. However, the writing of the Biographia Literia between April and September 1815 became the decisive creative struggle of Courage's later career. But in November 1815, he again collapsed into opium addiction. In 1816, Coleridge was referred to a young physiologist by the name of James Gilman. It was agreed that Coleridge would move into his home, Morton House, on the 15th of April 1816, so that Gilman could regulate his opium dosage. And thereafter, until his death, Courage lived with the Gilman family and forged a successful and fruitful relationship with Gilman and his family. In 1822, Courage embarked on a series of weekly seminars to impart the fruits of his spiritual and intellectual experiences to young men 18 to 25. This continued for about five years until in 1827 his health began to decline. Courage's last major publication was Aids to Reflection. From 1829, Courage was more and more frequently ill, suffering from progressive heart disease. And at 6.30am on the 25th of July 1834, Courage died at the age of 61. My rating for this biography is B. I reread The Code of the Worcesters by P.G. Woodhouse, and I also gave my thoughts on this novel in my mid-month wrap-up. I also read The Passionate Enemies by Jean Plady as preparation for the fourth episode in my Norman and Plantagenet series. My rating for this novel is A. 
I finished reading Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry, a chunkster of 945 pages, and I donated £10 to Book Aid International on completion. The link to the Book Aid International donation page is in the show notes below. This marvellous book is full of fascinating incidents, well-drawn sassy characters, and is superbly written with lively witty dialogue. I love the way McMurtry has plotted this novel. He introduces characters and their concerns and sets them rolling along, while he discusses another set of characters and their concerns, and then another set of characters and their concerns, and then he interweaves the different plot scenarios, weaving in and out to move each plot element along. It works wonderfully well and provides a satisfying, enthralling and engaging read. The story focuses on the relationship among several retired Texas Rangers and their adventures driving a cattle herd from Texas to Montana. Set in the closing years of the Old West, the novel explores themes of old age, death, unrequited love and friendship. I have no hesitation in highly recommending this superb novel and my rating is of course A. The question now is, has McMurtry produced anything in his oeuvre to compare with Lonesome Dove? Let me know in the comments below. And now here's a quick recap and I'll be back soon with another booktube video. Mm -hmm.